of our locations. Come on, all of our locations. Everybody who watches online, we love you guys. If you don't know, my name is Joey. I'm the lead pastor here. And uh, what you just saw uh, is our Christmas services coming up. And uh, we hope you'll join us. All right. And I'll recap that right uh, at starting Friday night in Center City, 7 p.m., Saturday night in the Northeast, 5 p.m., then normal Sunday services, Port Richmond, 9, 10, 30, Northeast, 10, 30, 12. And then we'll come back for something completely different. So that's our production home. And then we'll come back uh, on a Monday, Christmas Eve, 4 p.m., for just a beautiful candles and carols. That's where we'll do our candle lighting. So that's amazing. I hope you join us, bring people. We'll be great, little production. And, uh, and then uh, also something we do Christmas time uh, is we take a special offering. We call it Happy Birthday Jesus. Uh, it's his birthday. You know, we're celebrating the birth of Christ. And so, uh, and so what we do is we just say, hey, would you be willing to take back a gift uh, that you might be getting and give that sacrificially? So if somebody's getting you a gift, say, you know what? I'd like the money for that this year to give to a special cause. And we're going to be blessing families in our church and doing a lot of stuff with it. So that's what Happy Birthday Jesus is. We'll take that offering the 16th and the 23rd. Everybody got that? If you do, say yes. Okay. Good. All right. Well, I, I'm excited to uh, dive into uh, our, our series, week four of Go With The Overflow. Go With The Overflow. I hope you've enjoyed the last three weeks. Uh, didn't your location pastors do an amazing job last week? Come on. They did. And, uh, and so, you know, we are recapping a, an, a, an incredible year of overflow. Uh, at your location's merch table, there is a yearbook uh, that recaps the year of overflow. And uh, you should go grab that thing. It's beautiful. You can even write notes to people in it. Okay, we're throwing it way back. And uh, it's really cool. And it just recaps this unbelievable year of overflow. We, in the beginning of the year, declared that this was the year of overflow. We give a word for the year. You guys want to know what uh, 20 2019's word is? You want me to tell you? I ain't telling you right now. And, uh, and so, but we've been celebrating this year of overflow. We've seen God move mightily in our lives, in our church, in our families, our resource, all kinds of things. And uh, so we've been celebrating that and finishing the year uh, talking about how to sustain overflow in 2019. And that's my whole goal today. In fact, the title of my message is God Goals, God Goals. And uh, how many of you could use some God goals in your life? Yeah. You know, I, 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 I see all the time on social media, Instagram and stuff, I see people writing, you know, hashtag goals, you know. And it's like somebody with, like, with a stack of cash, and they're like, goals. And I'm like, how'd you get that cash? Like, I don't know if that's a goal, you know. Like, like, or like, or like, like somebody like, takes a, like, posts a picture of like Justin Bieber and Haley Baldwin, and they're like, goals. And they've been dating for like four days and engaged already. I'm like, oh, is that a goal? Like, I don't know, you know, or like, or like Jay-Z and Beyonce, you know, and I know somebody's going to throw like a tomato at me for mentioning them, but I'm just like, didn't he cheat on her and she knows about it? And like, this is relationship goals, like for real? I don't think so. Anyway, nobody be mad at me for saying that. All I'm saying is I see stuff sometimes and I see goals and I'm like, I don't know if that's a goal. You know, and I wonder if in your life, sometimes you say things are goals, but like, are they really God goals? I'm not, I'm not saying good, rela good relationships are God goals. Good marriages are God goals. Good, good finances and reasons, that's God goals. But I want to really teach you how to make some God goals today. And uh, I want to I want to teach you uh, how to, to go into 2019 to sustain the overflow or get in that flow for yourself. And I think it starts and it ends with good God goals. So that's really what I want to dive into today. Of course, you know that we'll go to the scriptures. But before we do, uh, I, I, you've heard it say that a, a, a goal without a plan is just a daydream, right? But I love what Napoleon Hill says. He says, a goal is a dream with a deadline. A goal is a dream with a deadline. And 2018 is ending, which means we have a deadline. We need to goal up. It's time to start thinking about 2019. All right, you need to start wrapping your head around what's happening tomorrow. You need to start wrapping your head around what is God calling me to be uh, today so that I can accomplish what he's asked me to accomplish tomorrow. 
Everybody got that? Are you with me so far? Okay. And so that's really where I want to I wanna go today. And with 2019 fast approaching, I believe if we want to sustain this overflow... We've got to ask God what he's asking of us. We need to form a spiritual plan. We need to get accountability in our lives. Okay, and so that's, that's really what I want, to, I want to inspire you with today. This message will seem incredibly practical. Sometimes when I get up here and preach, I'm walking through the scriptures, and it can, be, it can feel really good, and you can get goosebumps, and you can be like, oh, wow. And there are definitely practical implications of the spiritual layout and foundation that I'm giving you, but sometimes I just need to teach you and build the body. And, and, and so today, because there's a thing, there's preaching and then there's teaching. Preaching fires it up and inspires you. Sometimes teaching, it just cuts you a little bit. And so I need, to, I need to teach you a little bit today how to, how to manage and sustain your life. And so if you'd allow me to do that, if, if you'd be okay with me being extra practical today and understanding that there is something spiritual about the practical, then we can really grow. All right, so I want to go to, uh, to 1 Kings. And before I read, uh, I, want to, uh, I want to give you a little context of what's happening. The, the people of Israel have not received rain in three and a half years. And so they haven't, they, they are waiting on rain, they desperately need rain, and, and it's important for them. And so their overflow, their prayer request is rain. But Elijah the prophet is frustrated with God's people, and he recognizes that if they get their rain and they get what they want, they won't necessarily praise God for it, maybe in a moment, but they might go back to worshiping idols. And so Elijah recognizes that he needs a God goal, not a man goal. goal. And some of us, we are more like the Israelites. Now, let's just call it like it is. Me and you, we're more like the Israelites than we are like our example, Elijah, today. Where we, we got our man, God, hook me up, come through. I want the cash. I want the relationship. I want the stuff. I want the things. And while all of those things are not bad, those things can leverage our purposes in God if we don't have some God goals, some intrinsic values, some things that God wants first, those things won't actually lead us to God. They'll actually lead us away from Him. Am I talking to somebody today? And so Elijah recognizes this with this pastoral heart, and he says, no, I've got to turn the people back to God. I've got to get these people to have an encounter and an experience with God so that they, before they ever experience God's blessing, they understand God's purpose. They understand God's heart. And so what happens here is the king assembles the people, and that's where we'll pick up 1 Kings chapter 18. The Bible says, so Ahab summoned all the people of Israel and the prophets to Mount Carmel. Then Elijah stood in front of them and said, How much longer will you waver, hobbling between two opinions? So let me stop there. What's happening is the people are, 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 are worshiping Baal, this, this idol, this fake uh, idea of culture that really doesn't have power it just might have emotions or feelings. Does that sound familiar? That we worship things sometimes that really don't have uh, power necessarily to transform us, but they do give us emotions that for a moment feel like something good is happening. And so Elijah summons everybody and he says this. He says, if the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, then follow him. But the people... We're completely silent. You know, when you're a person of God and when you begin to speak with wisdom and the power of God and the anointing of God, people listen. They shut up and there is a presence of God. Do you carry the presence of God? You know, it might be time for you to walk into 2019 carrying an aura about you. The anointing, the presence of God. And, and so, I, I'm thinking about Elijah and how he carries himself and what Elijah is doing is he's making a goal and so if you want to carry your overflow if you want to sustain your overflow you have to make a goal you actually have to make a goal I don't know that that there are such things as New Year's resolutions but sometimes we make the same New Year's resolutions every single year 
And sometimes those New Year resolutions are centered around bettering yourself, and that's not all wrong, but is there a spiritual implication to your goal? Elijah's goal here was is he wanted to turn the people's heart back to God. He wanted to rebuild the altar that the kings kept destroying. He wanted to have a moment with God that would transform the people. This was a God goal. And I would say for you, before you ever start making goals, you need to ask yourself, is God pleased with this goal? Is God in this goal? Is God about, will God bless this goal? And it's a fine line. It's a tension in the Christian walk and the Christian journey. Because is it wrong to hope and to believe and want and to dream and to want to build your business and to want to uh, take over the world and all those things? Uh, not necessarily. But if the Spirit of God is not behind it, speaking to you and encouraging you and pressing you in your hearts, then sometimes we begin to make goals that are not God goals and they leave us in a place of disarray. So Elijah, he makes a God goal. The reason that so many of us never get anywhere is because we're living off someone else's goal or last year's overflow. It's time to make a new goal and live in some new wine. I don't know about you, but I'm scared for the year of overflow to end. I mean, it's been an unbelievable season. You heard during the offering illustration that, I mean, our church has almost doubled this year. It's been remarkable, the, the, the salvations and the stories and what's happened in my life and probably what's happened in your life. And again, I'm not naive to think that you haven't had a difficult or challenging year. That's also possible. And if you want to know what that means, go back to week two of the series. But the point is, is I'm a little bit, when, you, when you're in a season of winning or when you won, it's easy to get complacent. It's why it's difficult for teams to win championships a second time. Because once you've won, it's hard to rev up the engine again and say, let's go press further, higher, deeper, and longer. But what I'm telling you is what was old wine, it's time to move on and experience something new. Do we believe that God can exceed our expectations or not? Do we believe that God is who he says he is? then I believe that there could be something even greater on the other side of overflow. It might look different, it might sound different, and it might not tickle your insides like overflow does, but when we do it God's way, it's exceedingly abundantly beyond anything we could ever ask for or imagine. Come on, talk to me. Matthew 9, 17 says, No one puts new wine into old wineskins, for the old skins would burst from the pressure. Spilling the wine and ruining the skins. New wine is stored in new wineskins so that both are preserved. Well, what am I illuminating to you? What am I trying to tell you? That last year, 2018, was great. But our God is greater. And for some of us, maybe we've just been circling around and, and we've been celebrating or trying to live off our encounter with God at a youth camp when we were 13 years old. But it's time for more. It's time for deeper. And I'm not even talking about more stuff, more houses, more money, more that. I'm talking about it's time to go deeper with God in 2019. It's time to pick it up again and say, God, you can have all of me. I know for the past 10 years, I've been giving you portions of me. And maybe even since I've been part of this church, you've gotten a little bit more of me. But what would happen if God got all of you? What would happen? It's time. It's time to move on from what was and pursue what is and what can be. So how do we make God goals? How do we make God goals? The first thing that we have to do is we've got to stop and listen. We've got to hear from God for our lives. That's essentially what that means. Does everybody understand that? Let me break it down for you. I'm talking about overflow. Go with the overflow. And every summer... I begin to think about and listen for the word that God might give us for our church every summer. And that's when I begin to start understanding this is the word for the year. And so what I'm doing before I even make a declaration or a goal, because that's what that overflow word has been. It's been a spiritual goal. It's been a declaration. It's been a faith challenge. It's been a hope. But before I ever declare it, I've got to hear it. 
And, and making a God goal, it starts with listening for a God word. I mean, somebody should have said amen to that. Making a God goal, it starts with hearing a God word. The reason that some of us don't necessarily have God goals is because we're not hearing or listening for God word. But it takes us long enough to stop and to listen and to slow down and say, God, what are you saying to me? And I'm telling all summer long, I'm asking that question. I'm looking for things. I'm, I'm listening. I'm having conversations. You know, God can speak in a variety of ways. He can speak in your quiet time. He can speak through someone. He can speak through a donkey. Which means even my dog could help me understand word from God. God could speak through your spouse. He could speak through your kids. He could speak through an unbeliever. The, the, the hearing from God is you tuning in and saying, I know God wants to speak to me. Am I listening? And I'm looking for it. I'm listening. I'm, I'm saying, does this line up with God's word? Is this possibly a God goal? So I'm listening. Another way that you make a God goal is you pay attention to the dreams in your soul. It's okay to have dreams. It's possible that God put those dreams in there. Now, if you have a dream to be a gang banger, and, or, or if you have dreams to be, you know, a, you know what, or whatever, I would venture to say probably not a God goal. Let's submit that, that dream to the Lord. But, but, if, 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 if you have something inside of you that, that you're dreaming about and you know that it will impact the world in a positive way, you know that it will impact your community, your family, you know that it will transform. If you've got some dream inside of you that, you know, that will better your community, that will enhance and build the kingdom of God, it's possible that that could be a God goal. And so as you dream and as you think and as God stirs things in your heart, you know, I think it can be as simple as I want to start a business that employs people who are convicts that can't get jobs. I would say that would be a God goal. Right? Or, or, or you can go down the list. What's, what's stirring in your heart? What's stirring in your soul? Another way to make a God goal is to look at the needs in your life. Do you have needs? Do you need a miracle? If you have needs and if you need a miracle, then it's possible that could be a time to make a goal. If your marriage is falling apart, that's a need in your life. You need to set a God goal to fix your marriage. If your relationship with your kids is broken, then it should be a God goal to fix it. If you are in continual and constant financial detriment, it's time to make a God goal to get out of debt. It's time to make a God goal that I should probably stop spending in areas that I shouldn't spend. I mean, you can go down the list. What's a need in your life? It's okay to make that a God goal. Are you with me so far? So we've got to make a goal. Uh, let me recap. Elijah's goal had spiritual implications. You can make a practical goal that has spiritual implications and you are doing something with God's power behind it. The Bible says in verse 22, Then Elijah said to them, I am the only prophet of the Lord who is left. Elijah, by the way, was a little bit dramatic. I mean, ministers sometimes, they're just a little bit, not me. I know you would never. But your location, pastor, probably is... I'm perfect in all of my ways, you know. I'm a good, good pastor. It's who I am. But Elijah said to them, if you don't understand joking or, or you're uptight or, or, or overly spiritual, I'm not perfect in any of my ways. Just ask my wife. But I am to my kid, and don't you tell him anything different. Hey, can I please read the Bible, people? Okay. Then Elijah said to them, I am the only prophet of the Lord who is left, but Baal has 450 prophets. Now bring two bulls. The prophets of Baal may choose whichever one they wish and cut it into pieces and lay it on the wood of their altar. 
but without setting fire to it. I will prepare the other bull and lay it on the wood on the altar, but not set fire to it. Then I'll call on the name of your God, and I will call on the name of the Lord. The God who answers by setting fire to the wood is the true God. And all the people agreed. This is a beautiful image. What Elijah is doing is he's making a plan. It's not enough to have a goal. You've got to then make a plan. Okay. Let me say that again for those of us who've got a lot of lofty ideas, a lot of lofty dreams, and a lot of lofty goals. It's not enough to have a God goal. You also have to have a God plan. Okay. So th this plan, which was my second thing I was saying, uh, is it's a completely spiritual thing. Okay? It's, it's completely spiritual. He is, he is, he's putting some work into it. Th this is the part that we don't like. Okay? Th this is the hard part. Th this is the planning stage. This is the, I'm going to now go get a bull. And I'm going to carry, remember, they're on a hill. So all of this work, and I'm going to read you some more things that they do. They're climbing up hills with bulls and water and all kinds of things. I mean, this is work. And I believe that faith is spelled risk, but faith is also spelled work. And if you don't work your faith, then do you really have faith? Okay. Right? And so, so Elijah, he's saying, look, we're going to put our money where our mouth is. We're going to carry this thing all the way up the mountain. We're going to chop it into pieces. That probably took some time. Come on, somebody. It probably took some time. We are so impatient. We want all the things to happen right away. But sometimes to experience the move of God and your goals being accomplished, it takes some time. You gotta have, you gotta pay attention to some detail. Can I say that again? You gotta pay attention to the details. The details matter. He's cutting it up, he's preparing it. Make sure you don't put any water on the wood. Why is that, why is that important? Because it's such a lofty, incredible goal, but it does have a plan. But the only way for this lofty plan and goal to work is if God does it. How do you know you have a God goal and you're working a God plan? Hold on. How do you know? It's because, God, if you don't come through, this ain't going to work. Don't mock God with your safe plans and your safe goals. Dream. Dream again. But also plan with your dreams. I'm going to do my part, but then God has to do his part. I think a lot of Christians... Hello, a lot of Christians, they, they have an idea, but they never do their part. Unless I said, Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me. Right? I mean, and we got to do our part and, and God will do his. He always meets us more than halfway, but we got to carry some bulls up to the top of the mountain. See, a God plan is a practical strategy that springs up from a spiritual idea. Don't you dare have a spiritual idea but not put a strategy to it. That's offensive. That's why Christians get a bad rap. That's why we don't see miracles. Uh, faith in motion is saying, I've heard from God, now I'm going to put a little work to it. But I know that even in my work, even in my best, <laughs> it's not going to happen if God doesn't do it. Uh, what, what happens here is, is, is Elijah, verses 31 through 35, he takes 12 stones. This is significant. His dream in this is that the 12 tribes of Israel would be united again. He takes 12 stones. He digs a trench to hold three gallons of water. In other words, he's digging a trench. He's making some room. This is so good. Listen, he's making room. Some of us, we, we say we want to see God move, but we're never making room in our life. This might mean I got to cut up some credit cards. That's my plan this year. This means I might have to get some people out of my life this year. This might mean I might need to take some time to go get on my face before the Lord so that I don't hang out with people and get into dumb positions because I'm not hearing from God. So I've got to make room. It means I'm going to go to bed earlier in 2019 so that I can get up earlier and spend a little time with the Lord so that I'm not going through my day making dumb decisions and wondering why. And go, well, I never spent any time with the Lord or read my Bible, so I keep doing foolish things, but I'm ignoring wisdom. 
I got to make room. This is the hard part. It, it, it might have been actually easier to bring the bulls up. But can you imagine carrying water up? Hey, newsflash, they didn't have cranes. They didn't have plumbing systems. They were bringing this thing up by hand. I'm just telling you, if you want to see God do something in your life, you got to bring some things up by hand. What are you? You got to make some room. Oh, you got to make some tough decisions. You got to draw it out. You need a think tank. You need to get some people around you going, bro, can I just tell you your life is a mess and this is why? You got to make some room and remove some wax out your ears so that people can speak life into you. I could go on and on and on. Got to make room. He, he then, they fill four large jars and pour it over the wood. This is ridiculous faith. They wanted to be, make sure that it was God. The only way to make sure that it's God is to take wild faith steps. This was work. And you might need to put some work in before the year ends to prepare for the new year. Can I talk to you about your finances for a moment? I don't care. I'm going to do it anyway. Every other year, we do a series on finances. This was the year we were off. And so we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about finances and generosity. And I just want to say, church, we're proud of you and we're thankful for you for your generosity. You're not giving to us. You're giving through us. Okay. And if you go pick up that yearbook, you'll see all the things that God has done and the missionaries we've supported and all those kinds of things. But I just want to help you for a moment. This is the way that I live. This is the way I believe that the best way to live is. It's called the 10-80-10 principle. Have you heard of it? If you haven't, you're in luck today. Okay. Okay. We believe, I believe that the best way to live is to, right off the top, give 10% of your income back through the local church. I don't believe that's where you stop. I believe it's where you start. We call that tithing. My wife and I, every year that we've been married, uh, we have given, we've moved up a percentage. So we've been married six years. We are trying to give away 16% of our income. One day I believe that God is going to bless us to the place where we can give, well, I don't know if we'll make it this long, but I'd like to see us give 90% of our income away. We'd be really old. But the point is, is God, I, you, I'm telling you, you literally, you, it does not make sense, but it works. If you ask somebody who is a giver, they would say this to you. I can't afford not to give. I'm just telling you. So it's, it's right after that. I trust God because it's his in the first place. What it is, it's not the church going, I need your stuff or I need your money or God's saying, I need your stuff. God's going, I want your heart. And when you do that, it's just reminding yourself that this is all God's in the first place. Okay, we call that tithing. We call that obedience. We call that God's blessing on its way, and we don't do it to get. We do it so that God has our heart, and in return, God never lets us down. Okay. The, 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 the other 10 uh, is saving. I encourage you in your finances. Cut things. Work on this. Get out of debt so that you can get to the place where you can save 10%. Right? We call this wisdom and peace of mind. Because when something breaks... And I got some money in the bank. I'm not going crazy asking my neighbors for stuff. And if you're in a place in your life where you got to ask your neighbors for stuff, that's what your community is here for. But I'm telling you what your God goal should be. 10, 10, 80. Let's talk about the 80. If you can live on 80% or less, we call this healthy and we call this preventative. We call this preventative. Now, I'm not suggesting that right away, right now, and if you're feeling some sort of way, if you're feeling bad or guilty or any of those things, if you're not there, what I'm telling you is this is a God goal. This is what you should work toward. But it will never happen if you don't put a God plan to the God goal. I encourage you to work towards that. Uh, if you live that way, there's going to be peace of mind in your life. Work towards cutting the debt. Work towards getting things out of your life that don't belong so that you can get to that place. All right? You with me so far? If you are, say yes. Come on, you are, come on, everybody on the screen, yes? Okay. You don't have to believe me, but I dare you to try it. Heard a story, and I'm almost done, but I heard a story, um, I think this week, about a couple who's new to Christ. He had given his life to the Lord over this past year. 
um, and they have a child, and they've been just been in, been in a men's group and have sensed, man, I need to tithe. Why is this? Why is God stirring me on this? I need to get my finances on order. And had for months and months and months and months and months have been struggling with this idea of giving us first fruits to the Lord. And finally, last week, he said, I'm just going to do it. Because you never know if God's going to come through if you don't take a chance and pour some water on the altar. And so he does it. And later that day, they're at the grocery store. And for some reason, they go into this this line that was empty, there was only one person uh, in front of them. They, they tied that morning, went around, and some stranger ends up paying for half or all of their groceries. And, and it was so funny because he's going, I, w- I will never not tithe ever again. <laughs> because the idea that, like, God's got me. And like, and he, he got the revelation. It was, wasn't because somebody needed it or the church. It's because literally like God's trying to show me that everything I have is his. And when I give it back to him, it's a lot safer than if I keep it for myself. I just want to encourage you today. Make a God goal. But don't stop there. Make a God plan. It's about your heart. It's about your heart. All right, I'm going to close it down. I got... Three or four minutes left. I know you're sitting in your seat going, Pastor, the Eagles don't play today. I wish that you would preach for three hours. But I respect your time, and I'm going to finish in about three or four minutes or five. The Bible says, verse 30, Then Elijah called to the people, come over here. Stay with me. They all crowded around him. Elijah says, come over here. They all crowded around him as he repaired the altar of the Lord that had been torn down. And then, somebody say, and then. And then the water ran around the altar and even filled the trench. At the usual time for offering the evening sacrifice, Elijah the prophet walked up to the altar and prayed. Oh Lord. God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, prove today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant. Prove that I have done all this at your command. O Lord, answer me. Answer me so these people will know that you, O Lord, are God and that you have brought them back to yourself. What does Elijah do? He makes a goal. He makes a plan. And then he goes and he makes it public. He makes it public. It's powerful what happens here because it's important for you to understand that you can't just make a goal and make a plan but let nobody else in on what's happening. There's two ways to go public with your plans. There is the humble and the contrite way where you're gathering godly people around you. He knew that even though these godly people were wayward, he still needed to gather gather them around because when God would move, he, he knew that deep in their heart they wanted to see God win. I believe that. And so, so he gathers them around and he's saying, I'm making this public. I'm going to make this prayer. I'm going to make this declaration. There's a way to go public with things. A humble way, getting the right people around you to say, keep me accountable. Right? There's also a way to be obnoxious about it. And some of us do this and we skip step number two. We make a goal and then we go public with the goal without a plan. And we're like, we just get so like, ah, just spazzy. And we're like, I'm going, to, I'm going to own Disney World. And then we post a picture at the castle and say, it's mine, 2020. You know, it's like, I don't, I don't know why Disney World hit my heart. But, but we do. And it's like, it's like, well, how are you going to own Disney World? Like, like you're in like $200,000 of school debt. Maybe you should work on that before Disney World. You know, like, I don't know. And what, what the prophets did of Baal, listen to this. The prophets of Baal during this time, okay, they are chanting, yelling, they're making a scene, they're cutting themselves. They're, 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 they're just ravages, they're going nuts, they're dancing and singing and shouting day and night. And I think for some of us, we've created blisters, burns, and wounds in our lives or the lives of others because our goals We're always about us, not the kingdom. 
They were trying to fulfill something. This prophet of Baal was to sexualize them and to have this unbelievable freedom to be and do and what. And, and they thought that was freedom, but what it really was was slavery. And for some of us, we've gone our own way and created goals because those, we thought that those goals would be freedom, but they were slavery because they were not rooted in God goals. And in doing so, listen, we went public to boast out of insecurity or pride, and the results were empty. We, we, we've got to be careful to not go public when it's about us. But when you sense that you have a God goal and a, a God plan, or you're gathering others to help you build this God plan, it's time to let some people know and say, keep me accountable. I love what... Habakkuk 2.2 2 says, it says, And the Lord answered me, Write the vision, make it plain on tablets, so he may run who reads it. In other words, people need to know what your goals are and how they can help you. I love what Proverbs 15.22 says, Plans fail for a lack of counsel, but with many advisors they succeed. I hate working out. do but when somebody picks me up for the gym it's a lot easier nobody's picking me up right now but when they do and like I want someone yelling at me the whole time like I'm a football coach like in my heart like I, I basically run this church like a football coach so if I scared you I apologize but like, I want someone literally like yelling at me while I'm working out, you know, like I'm, I could be like stretching, stretch, you know, and it's like, you know, it's like, like, that's what I need. You might need something different. But the point is, is I need somebody and you need somebody. You, you want a deeper relationship with God, do a devotional with somebody. But you want to be more plugged in and more selfless, serve with somebody. You want to be less greedy, give to others. And give with others. You want to make friends? Go to a group. You want joy? Stop complaining and start laughing. All right. You want healing? Talk with somebody. Man, get it out. Make it. Make the plan public. But do it the right way. So let's recap. Elijah. He had a goal. He had a plan. And he made it public. And I know I'm going a little bit long, but listen to what the Bible says. Verse 38. Immediately. The fire of the Lord flashed down from heaven and burned up the young bull, the wood, the stones, and the dust. It even licked up the water in the trench. That's overflow right there. And when all the people saw it, they fell face down on the ground and cried out, The Lord, He is God. Yes, the Lord is God. Now, let me tell you something. The Bible says immediately. But we know there's no such thing as immediately. Here's what's going to happen. When you make a goal and when you make a plan and when you make it public... All that stuff has to happen, and you'll be sometime in 2019, and it's going to feel like immediately stuff is coming together, or 2020. I've just stayed with it and stayed with it, and somebody's going to go, man, you're an overnight success, but they didn't know about the time you were bringing water up the mountain, or you were praying, going, God, if you don't do it, it's not going to happen. There's no such thing as immediately. It's just going to look like immediately. And then guess what happened? It rained. It rained. So when the people got their heart right and made some God goals, then the floods came. What you've been waiting on, that has everything to do with your heart. Let's make some God goals in 2019. You believe that today? Can we stand to our feet all over this room? I'm going to ask Pastor Grace to come.